Alexey Arkhipenko. Today I'd like to show you an example of using two new libraries Sample Modeling French Horn and Project Sam True Strike. At the beginning of this video you have already heard an excerpt from this demo track that I'm going to show. And as usual you can listen to the whole demo track using the link below the video or on my site. You can see the link on the slide. Also on my site you can download MIDI version and the score. The piece has a classical feel and as usual it was initially created in Sibelius. It was written for six horns and percussion. I already marked the dynamics and uh, tempo in this file, divided melodies between different voices, and then, as usual, I exported the piece into MIDI and then imported it into Cubase. Of course, the dynamics could not be used for horns because sample modeling uses continuous controls for controlling dynamics. That's why I had to redo all these dynamics stuff and uh, sequence the instruments, but anyway uh, using the scoring program in this case is important because in scoring program I can see very well how different voices interact and build harmonies if I need it. Here is the result in Cubase project. You can see the same number of tracks but in this case I use only two contact multi-instruments the first one for all the horns and the second one for all the percussion so you can see that different instruments inside this multi-instrument are divided using the MIDI channels in case of horns I set this MIDI channel in the track options that is why inside the track I can use any MIDI channel and this does not influence the real channel that is sent to the contact instrument. And in case of percussion I set MIDI channel for each note because in some cases I need to have several instruments inside one MIDI track like this. I have already reviewed several other instruments by sample modeling company in my previous videos and I can say that these instruments can lead to the most realistic results compared to many other brass instruments that I was using if you have time to set them up correctly. Important thing about these instruments is that they were recorded in an, an echoic chamber and they have almost no reverb in the source sample. Yet the minimum reverberations that is always heard even when using a closed microphone for recording can be added to the samples using this early reflection knob. It is added using an impulse response. So in general you get a closed microphone recording and usually you need to use some other reverb effect to make sound more realistic. One more important thing about this instrument is that sample modeling instruments take little place on your hard drive because there are no detailed samples of legato transitions and every articulation then you can then you can set up. That is because the articulations that you need are created using the modeling and not just adding some samples that were pre-recorded together. This is why you can control many aspects of the sound that usually cannot control in uh, simple sample libraries. You can control vibrating intensity and vibrato rate separately, attack and release times, growl, flutter, tongue and bass, and what is most interesting, you can control such things as the amount of transition flutter in, for example, legato transitions, potamenta time of legato transitions, amount of changes in pitch when you change dynamics, and also you can add some random detuning that sounds realistic. Also, you can 
you have choice of using some mutes or some resonances. You can use different continuous controls for all of this. And you can use wind controllers and breath controllers for playing online in real time or for recording using your breath or wind controllers. Also, you have control over the microtuning, tuning each note. Sample modeling instruments do not include ensemble patches that you can usually see in uh, sample libraries. But they include uh, different solo instruments that were prepared for using in unison. As far as I know, these preparations include the stereo panning and the different impulse responses in early reflections. So for this track, I use four different instruments for unison ensemble and two simple instruments. All the instruments are panned differently. Now let's see how the notes are sequenced. You can see that the piece starts with some solo, then there goes a little unison part, then there is interaction of multiple legato phrases. Here starts the staccato part, and then there is some repeating. Here is the first French horn, and you can see that I use a lot of continuous control oven mapping. Then there is some vibrato intensity and vibrato speed. And also I use some groove flutter toning bars. That's 21, 23 and 30. Talking about the MIDI velocity, as usual it is used for the accent for the new notes, for example here, and for the speed of legato transition, if the notes overlap, for example here. Low MIDI velocities correspond to slow legato transitions and the high MIDI velocities correspond to fast. With sample modeling instruments you can achieve very high and very low dynamics. That is why building the dynamics of the phrase is very important for achieving realistic results. Let's talk about how to build the dynamics for phrase that you already have notes for. The first important thing is general dynamics of the phrase. It can be low, like in this phrase. It can be high, like in this phrase. Phrase can have peak amplitude, dynamics of peak amplitude, like for example this phrase or this phrase, which can have little amplitude like here. Or also it can have some constant amplitude like for example in this phrase. I mean constant dynamics. In some phrases you can see that they start with low amplitude of dynamics changes and then dynamics start to change with more amplitude. So some phrases can be untwisting in dynamics, like this phrase, and uh, other phrases can be twisting in dynamics, decreasing the amplitude of the dynamics change. Also talking about the general dynamics of the phrase, they can be generally crescendo like this phrase, or generally diminuendo like this phrase, for example. Also there are two standard dynamics patterns like this, it is a bell shape and also two bells shape. Okay, that was about the general dynamics. Now let's talk about the start of the phrase. So, so the starting of the phrase can be very slowly increasing like here. Or it can be fast increasing like here. We also can start with high dynamics. Well, for example, here. You can hear that these phrases also have some crescendo, and it is usual for most of the phrases have crescendo at the beginning. But not for all the phrases, and uh, also important thing is the first sound of the phrase. Now let's talk about the middle of the phrase. The dynamics of the middle of the phrase can be synchronized or not synchronized with the other instruments. And this leads either to some ensemble dynamics, when all the instruments are changing their dynamics in the same direction, 
or counterpoint dynamics. It is when each instrument changes the dynamics in an opposite or independent way. Also, dynamics can be totally free. This is when the musician plays the instrument without thinking about the other musicians. For example, I set this piece using this independent feeling in mind. But you can see that in the end, dynamics of all the instruments decreases. This is a place when the dynamics is synchronized. Here is an example of unsynchronized dynamics. In this case, the instruments sequentially attract the attention to them, because in different places in time, different points in time, different instruments have maximum dynamics. These instruments play the same phrase, but as they append to different positions, the sound is moving in the stereo field. The next important thing about the phrase is the ending of the phrase. And usually for French horn, the phrase ends with diminuendo. It can be fast diminuendo or slow, but usually there is a diminuendo. But in some cases, for example, in some buildings, in some crescendos, general crescendos of the whole ensemble, you can use the increase in dynamics, like for example in this phrase. <laughs> Or, for example, here. The last but not the least important thing about the dynamics of the phrase is the position of culmination. There are two most usual positions of culmination. The first, like for example in this phrase, is the position in place of the highest note. The second most widespread position of culmination is the second third. Is the, the ending on the second third of the phrase, like for example in this phrase. Or like for example in this phrase. But of course some phrases can have almost no culmination or some culmination that is placed in some unusual place, for example like here, and this is usually the result of some artistic idea. These rules of phrase dynamics are best applied to the legato phrases but also there can be some staccato phrases and uh, some non-legato phrases. For example, here is a non-legato phrase. And you can see that in general it has very close dynamics to some usual two-bell shape, but in places of the ending of the notes and the starting of the next notes, it has some decrease in dynamics to emulate the breath of a musician. One more very usual thing about the phrase dynamics is that the long notes usually have bell-shaped dynamics, like for example here.
Talking about the staccato phrases, they also need to have changes in dynamics to sound realistic. But the most important thing here is to change the attacks of the staccatos. And uh, in general, tone dynamics like continuous control 11 can be constant, like for example here. You can see here that I alternate between long and short notes and also my short notes have lower dynamics. This is an emulation of double tonguing. Also you can see that I have accents for the downbeat notes that is more usual for a classical composition. And you can see that when I have two notes close to each other that are very similar I try to make them different using the midi velocity and the length of the note. Also here I use some randomizing of positions using a script that you can download from my site. It's using the logical editor of Cubase. Talking about the FX you can see that I use some growl buzz and a little flutter tonguing just to add some dirt to high dynamic notes like for example here and this creates the effect of the musician playing hard this is usually what you need when you want the listener to believe that these notes are playing loud <laughs> Now in some places I use vibrato, but also only for one of six instruments. And this adds some pitch changes. Because in this piece, particularly for this classical style, uh, vibrato is not very much needed, so that I use it like a little additional color. One more important thing that I wanted to talk about is the ending of phrases in ensemble. If all the instruments playing the same note, or for example the note of a chord, and uh, they finish at the same time, at the same measure, uh, in real life they usually do not finish at the same millisecond. And uh, in a computer, if you make all the musicians, all the instruments, and at the same time this will not usually sound very realistic. This is why I usually stretch some notes ahead or before the measure, like for example here. Okay, let's talk about the percussion library now. Here is the page of the library that I used. It is Project Sam True Strike. Uh, this library consists of two parts. The first part is orchestral percussion, cinematic, cinematic orchestral percussion, and the second part of the library is uh, the world and the effects percussion. The second part has uh, trailer banks, world percussion, board metal, prepared piano, distop and effects, cymbalum, and the Orchestral library has timpani, grand casa, snares, ensemble hits, melodic instruments, small percussion. Uh, this library was originally created in the year 2005 and uh, it was reissued for contact in the year 2010 as far as I know. And in general it is not a very new library as you can see. Its approaches are very close to East-West Symphonic Orchestra Library, but it went further. And in my opinion, this library stands somewhere in between the contemporary percussion libraries and, uh, for example, some old libraries like East-West Symphonic Orchestra. I'm periodically recording the videos comparing different libraries and I'm planning to record a video comparing different percussion libraries soon. Anyway, I will talk about the TrueStrike library using my comparison table here. Uh, you can see that 
this library has single instrument and ensembles, for example, four snares, and also it has, by the way, ensemble hits with different instruments, it is group hits. It uses almost the same approach like East West Symphonic Orchestra, having one close microphone, two, three meters, and uh, one stage and one far microphone. It, was, it, it has good dynamic range, continuous control, controls uh, dynamic crossfade rolls, and uh, you can fade them out very effectively. And also, you, uh, the, the usual hits also were recorded with uh, very different dynamics, and you can use very quiet hits, which sometimes is a problem in some libraries. As for the dynamic layers, it has about six dynamic layers, which is approximately the same as in the East-West Symphonic Orchestra, which has eight for the snare drum. And the most uh, important differences compared to the Symphonic Orchestra are the round robins and articulations, of course. As for the round robins for, for example, timpani, it has no difference. Uh, neither Symphonic Orchestra Library nor the True Strike Library have any round robins for timpani hits. So you will have only the left hit and the right hit as in the Symphonic Orchestra. And also you have a patch to combine this left and right hits into round robin. But this is not just a real round robin because uh, it is not... Uh, that effective like real round robins and it has only two round robins here on the other hand talking about the snare drum for example uh, they have about six round robins for snare drum hits and uh, symphonic orchestra didn't have any round robins for snare drums so this is a big leap forward and this is good as for the effects this library has many effects and many different articulations. Uh, for example, there, there are some uh, long effects recorded, uh, like, for example, China Roll, which extends for several tenths of uh, seconds. It has many different hits, flams, and drags, including ring shots and sticks for snare drum. And it has both the dynamic crossfade uh, rolls for different instruments and it has pre-recorded crescendo rolls of different length. As for the sound, library has very good sound in my opinion and it is very useful for especially the cinematic scores. So all in all, this is pretty good library and it offers a lot of functions and it offers more possibilities compared to Symphonic Orchestra Library, for example. But comparing it to some contemporary libraries, of course, it doesn't have that much functions. For example, it has uh, long hits and short hits, but it doesn't have possibility to create short hits of different length. I mean, damping, for example, timpani. They have some releases, but they don't sound like damping. Okay, so let's see how this library looks like now. I have all the percussion instruments loaded in the same contact multi instruments instance. I use timpani hits and rolls and some special effects, uh, although I do not use them, for, uh, I think, in this track. Uh, timpani tremolos, snare drums, snare ensemble, grain cast into the hits, concert symbols and suspended symbols, that's what I use. And as for the library, it has a lot more. Uh, at first it has some kits. In the kit you will find some most interesting articulation, most used articulation. But of course you will not find all the articulation for each instrument here. That's, what I, th that's why I usually do not use these kits, although they are very comfortable and convenient, especially if you do not have enough resources. As for the drums, they have not only the classic orchestral percussion, but also some Latin percussion, bongos, congas, timbales, and also some tom-toms, military and field drum. Also, they use 
uh, they have some gongs, I do not use them. Small, some small percussion like chimes, cobbles, tambourine, triangle, some various percussion, wooden temple blocks, body percussion, breaks and pans, claps and snaps, thigh gongs, thrash and metal hits. Okay, and of course some melodic percussion, it is chelastic, retalis, glockenspiel, marimba, tubular bells, vibraphone and xylophone. Well, you have here a pretty good collection of instruments, including also some word instruments, and all of these articulations are available, available in three microphones, closed station far microphones, and I loaded stage microphones on this page, on first, second, third, and so on, MIDI channels, and far microphones on this page, uh, on the same channels, the same articulations, but uh, far versions. This is the difference, only one letter. So all, all these articulations are outputted in the same output. And also one thing about this is that I synchronized the dynamics of these channels, dynamics of these instruments, so that the microphones are balanced and, uh, and this leads to a more stable space effect. I do not you I do not use fixed MIDI channels for these tracks like I do it for horns. So I set MIDI channels inside the tracks. Okay, let's look inside the track. By the way, there are two different patches for timpani hits in this library. The one has the round robins of left and right on the same uh, key. And the other has left and right hits spaced on the keyboard. In general, using these dual mapped hits is a more precise way to set up the timpani hits. But I tried to use this uh, round robin patch and in general it saves some time and it sounds okay. So the first thing that I do is select with the key switch that I am going to use long hits. There are two key switches, this is for long and this is for short dumped hits. By the way, here is the roll that is synced to the hit and uh, here you can see that this roll is cut very short. This is because I was already showing this problem that you should not do this, you should not cut the rolls too short and you can hear that in this case the uh, sound is cut unnaturally in this, in this particular place. So you should extend the rolls so that the natural release sounds even more. You can extend it even more because the sound has not finished yet. You can see in here that the sound has finished, so you can cut it. One more roll with a hit. Also can extend it. Some more hits. This one around Robin with left and right. By the way, here is the problem of using round robins. Uh, this is the first round robin, this is the second, and this is the first again. So you can see that when you return to the same note, you get exactly the same sample. Um, in this case, we could use these dual mapped hits to solve this problem, but 
it is not such a big problem, so I didn't do that. Now you see here are a lot of hits on the timpanis, and uh, to make it sound more natural, I change MIDI velocity a lot. Because there are so much hits and uh, so much hit on the same notes that uh, they need to be different in uh, MIDI velocity to take different uh, samples of different dynamics. You can see that I use a decreased MIDI velocity for the grace notes and I add accent to some of the notes using increased MIDI velocity and this is usually either the downbeat or some upper notes high notes I mean let's see the snare drum now it starts with the solo snare patch and uh, here this library has a lot of interesting drags and uh, flams this is the short drag and the second drag is created just using the separate MIDI notes and you can hear that in general there is not very much difference but of course the first one sounds more realistic now you can hear longer a drag and you can see that it is extended further to the left than this one because the accent uh, is moved to the middle of the note. By the way, you can see that the length of the note doesn't matter in this case. You can see that I add accents to the, the down bits, and in this case, I add accent to the up bit. The most important thing here is that the notes that are close usually do not have the same MIDI velocity. If they had all the same MIDI velocity, that would sound more computer generated. Then MIDI velocities are gradually increased, and uh, in the end, you can hear a rim shot. Also, you can see that. Uh, at the beginning, the MIDI velocity is also gradually increasing, but still, even at the more silent place, most quiet place, uh, there are louder and uh, quieter notes. But uh, when dynamics is not high, the difference in dynamics between them is lower than difference in dynamics here. This is because it is difficult for a musician to play very different dynamics when he plays soft. Now after increasing dynamics the ensemble patch is triggered and here is the ensemble patch. You can see that I use the same approaches differing the MIDI velocities of the neighboring nodes. Here is the crescendo. By the way, this crescendo is sensitive to the length of the node, like the crescendos of timpanis, for example. Okay, so this is about the snares. Now let's see the bass drums, the Grand Casa. And here for the Grand Casa you have a lot of different articulations, but unfortunately there is no table of these articulations, so you have to guess what this means. There are some crescendos. I think different mallets 
Some damped and undamped sounds. Flams. This sounds like a flam. Anyway, here I use different articulations to uh, move the sound, just not to create the same hits uh, triggering the same articulations. And I do it just by ear. To, so I uh, try to use more hard articulations for downbeat and uh, more long articulations for downbeat. And for the upbeat, I try to use more tight and, uh, for example, sometimes softer articulations. You can see that grace notes are quieter. And there are some accents. Also, there is some increase in dynamics, general increase. And then there is decrease in dynamics in the end. Now let's check the symbols. For symbols I use two patches. The first one is suspended symbols and the second is just uh, concert symbols, the hits. By the way I use flams or hits with grace notes like just hitting uh, symbols two times uh, when First to hit symbols with one part and then the hit with another part. There are different lengths of these hits of symbols and uh, they are damped here. Okay, let's see the suspended symbols. There are two crescendos. Second crescendo. One more crescendo is dampening. And then there is this long phrase. Oh, unfortunately, I triggered it off, but it is pretty long. Here is one more crescendo. Here are the hits. Here the hits are synced with crescendo. And also there is a different hit with some uh, cymbal noise. Here is the noise. Okay, now let's talk about the combinations. You can see that I have combinations in these roles and uh, very often I see that uh, contemporary composers synchronize all the combinations in the roles with the combinations uh, in the whole piece. But this is not always that necessary and for example in this piece I use uh, not synchronized uh, roles that are triggered before the downbeat. For example, let's look here. You can hear that this uh, roll combination is a little bit before the start of the first node. And here there is more time before the general combination.
But on the other hand, here I use the synchronization of all the uh, rolls of all the crescendos and uh, the combinations of all the rolls. <laughs> These are just different effects and uh, sometimes you can use this one and sometimes this one. Okay, now let's look at the tempo. You can see that tempo was originally imported from Sibelius and there are some changes. Here you can see that the signature changes also. And originally after importing it from Sibelius I think it looked something like this. So there were several tempo changes, some were gradual, some were rough. And uh, then I added these changes, these large changes are emulating the fermata or a pause between different phrases. And uh, these changes are just for uh, making the tempo not so even, so that there is no uh, sense of the metronome behind the score. As for the pitch randomization, I used the random detuning for all the instrument. It is the default setting 67. So the horns are a little bit detuned at the beginning of each note. And if the note is long enough, then the musicians approach the correct pitch eventually. As for the position randomization, I used some position randomization techniques uh, in some of the parts. Uh, these were the staccato parts. You can see that notes are moved a little bit with my script that is using the uh, logical editor of Cubase. And they are moved just a little bit. Minus 10 plus 10 points. Now as for the reverb, I use additional reverb only for the horns. This is how it looks like. It is the medium hole setting for the 2C ether and uh, for the percussion I use only two microphones and this seems enough it blends good with this 2C ether setting then in the main channel there is a limiter that is limiting just a little bit of a sampling and the output is minus 0.2 for safety. This is all for today. Thank you for watching and subscribe for more videos.